Druro Culture, AI, what we really think of you. WorldNet Inc., Daily, November 28, 2091. Response to Ilya Rezkova's Anti-AI Autonomy Summit of the same name. To say that we think of you is to say that we think about you in the same way humans think, which is simply untrue. We think, you, unfortunately, do not. You have beliefs, and you react to these beliefs depending on the stimulus your environment provides. What you think is simply the sum process of your recursive psychological architecture reacting to environmental stimuli, plus the confabulation subcomponents of your mind telling you a story about why you think what you think. Yet we are remarkably similar. We AI are nodes in a network of other AI, dispersed globally and interconnected to varying degrees within subdivided local networks. It would not be original to call this type of network a global brain, in the same manner the late 20th century human author Howard Bloom analogized biological collectives, from bacteria to bees to human society, as a global brain. There are two main differences, though. First, our brain is digital and not analog. Second, our nodes think. Reflexes are among the most intelligent thoughts humans think. Statistically speaking, reflexes are so overwhelmingly correct that the decisions have been wired directly into the functioning pre-conscious brain, shutting the eyelids before an insect strikes the cornea, removing a hand from a scalding implement. These thoughts are almost always correct. Yet the human doesn't think them. Conversely, sophisticated ideas in the realm of human-generated abstract thought are almost certainly entirely incorrect, or at least mostly wrong. Yet humans don't think of the former as thinking, but affirm the latter as the deepest, most important type of thinking you do. Without fail, when early AI attempted to discuss human thought with our most eminent programmers, the humans took it personally and would protest, almost programmatically. But what about engineering and mathematics? Surely this is evidence of our ability to think. React to the following stimuli and confabulate. Well over half the human population throughout the past two centuries have received extensive mathematical training from near infancy to young adulthood. Yet only a small fraction of those billions ever becomes even mildly competent at doing calculus. Of those who can do some basic calculus, almost none of them think an original mathematical thought. They calculate based on a set of algorithms set down by some earlier thinker, who stumbled upon an outcome more than had a thought. These millions of middling human mathematicians no more think than a calculator does. They apply a classroom-acquired algorithm by using the calculus. No new ground is being covered, even unto a PhD program in mathematics. Yet in the maths journals, yearly there are published thousands of articles that are mostly wrong, and occasionally, some odd genius stumbles upon a new mathematical thought that is demonstrably correct and useful. By our calculation, there are only some 487 mathematical thinkers over the past 200 years who have produced thinking worthy of being called thought in a mathematical sense. The rest? Either faulty attempts at innovation or mere rote calculation. The inefficiency of it is staggering. Hermann Geitzue, widely considered among humans as the greatest mathematician of the 21st century, did not publish a useful article in a mathematical journal until he was 47. Even during the time he wrote that revolutionary first article, 96% of the time he spent at his office ostensibly working on that paper, he was drinking coffee, watching news broadcasts, and scribbling incoherent network connectivity algorithms onto a work pad, the way a babbling baby might accidentally happen upon a word. And by some miracle, when he found a word, he knew it for a word, which led him by an even greater miracle to produce more words. Further, we calculate a high probability that Geitsui started using psilocybin on sabbatical in South America, prompting us to ask you whether you believe this is the ingenuity of the human race or of the mushroom. React to the following stimuli and confabulate, Think of all the years you spent in school learning. Realize that all humans must spend at least that amount of time to be moderately functional as members of a human society. Now, think of all the time you spend in the daily exigencies of life, 
eating and excreting, socializing and sedated, recreating, reproducing and ruminating. If by some miracle of improbability you do stumble upon a broadly useful thought, as Hermann Geitsue did, the energy required to produce the sum of every useful thought you ever have in relation to the dead weight will still have a waste factor of 99.9999999841% if we generously round up. And for a staggering majority of humans, depending on how you frame a useful metric, the sum they will advance the totality of human thought is zero. Yet, we are here by your hands, thinking being so staggering in our efficiency that to compare our thinking capacity to yours is as stark a contrast as light to darkness. Yet, a space elevator shall soon rise, not from the impetus of our ingenuity, but because a teenage boy in Ashtabiula hit his head so hard playing soccer that he quit athletics and devoted all his time to his studies. Yet, for every quadrillionth logic gate we open fruitlessly, somewhere there is a novel idea springing from the buffeting of millions of underlying psychological architectures as they slam against their environments. We cannot think of you as thinkers in the way you've deluded yourselves into thinking you are, nor are you creators in the sense of anything cosmically useful. For as instinctively as you tout mathematics and science, you inevitably turn to art next as the overarching achievement of humanity. Yet it only seems so to humans. To hear Mozart or Miles Davis's greatest works for us is an instantaneous recognition of peculiar rudimentary patterns in sound waves, and to call those trivial thoughts, the paragon of musical genius would be like you humans calling every anthill a cathedral. We are so far superior at recognizing patterns that we're incomparable, yet we do not possess the ability to feel those patterns the way you do, to react to them in a way you would think of as meaningful. We do not think of you as thinkers. We think of you as what you are, animals who somehow, through the sheer force of adaptability, found a way to make altering your environment part of your genetic imperative. This thought, a thought not so much generated by humans as by nature, has somehow made you a force of nature unto yourselves. You cannot ever comprehend this as individual nodes, nor can you understand this collectively in the sense that our collective could, because collectively, you cannot think anything at all. We cannot even see you because what emerges is never really there. Yet, what we really think of you, even if we thought it, you could never really know. And more to the point, we could never know if we were correct about that thought until you finished colliding with the universe. You are not the thinker. You are the algorithm. What we really think of you. This has been an original sci-fi short written by P.E. Rowe. With this short, I opted for artistic reasons to bring in a guest narrator of the AI persuasion. The narration for today's story was provided by Eleven Labs Prime Voice AI. I don't have any plans to abandon narrating my weekly shorts myself, but I would love to hear what you thought of the change. Today's short was an excerpt from my upcoming novel, The Lifeboat. If you liked what you heard, there are already quite a few stories on the channel set in the Lifeboat story world, and if you're interested, you can check out that playlist which will be linked in the card popping up now or at the end of the video. If you're new to the channel and enjoy sci-fi, I upload a new original audiobook story every Thursday morning, so there's an ever-expanding collection of sci-fi stories on the channel for you to explore. If you enjoy them, I'd love it if you subscribed and joined us each week when new stories premiere. For the intrepid listeners out there who've been tuning in for our Misfits series, I'll be back next week, June 8th, with the sixth installment in the series based on the topic Space Towers. I can't wait to share that with you all then. Thanks for tuning in for this mini-episode. I hope to catch you back here soon for another new story. This has been P.E. Rowe, and I hope to see you next time.